Our first speaker today is Jen Lerner, and Jen is a senior res resource educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Putnam County. Jen provides education on a variety of topics, including commercial horticulture, gardening, natural resources, and environmental education. And we are fortunate to have Jen kick off our 2024 schedule with a presentation on pruning, why, when, and how we prune woody plants. So take it away, Jen. Thanks, Matt. Um, hopefully the sound is good. Um, and while we just begin to talk about this, I'd love for you to find the chat window and type in there what type of shrub or tree that you are the most concerned about pruning uh, and getting it right. Because I will say that this is a topic that seems to make a lot of people very nervous. Um, and I think that it's a little, it's also a little difficult to talk about it in this, in this dimension when it's something that frequently you really have to see in, in three dimensions as you're working in the landscape, but we're going to do our best today. So let me see what folks are typing in there. Lilac, sure, a lot of times we get questions. Ligrostromia, who gets to grow that? Um, wow, okay. Multi-stemmed woody, woody shrubs, okay. Blue spruce. Oh, that's a great one. That's a t that's an interesting and tough one. I love to see all the variety here. Osage orange. That's awesome. Um, Beautyberry, another multi-stem shrub. White pine, another needled evergreen. Okay. Great myrtle. Legostromia. Awesome. Blueberry. Okay. Blueberry. I don't know. We get really get into blueberry, but some of the things that we're going to talk about with rhododendrons will also apply to blueberries as well. So great. Oh, love it. Okay, hydrangea. I'll say here that in our diagnostic lab, that probably the two most common we get questions about are hydrangea and lilacs. Um, they're the, they're, not only are they very common, but there's some pruning uh, problems with them that often occur and some growing problems that often occur. So we will definitely touch on those today. Lots, okay. Let's see if I can get this thing to advance now that I got it stuck. All right, we'll go that way. So what we'll cover today, we'll cover why we prune, when we prune, and how, and then just look at a few techniques, and then if we have time, we'll look at some uh-ohs and no-nos uh, in pruning. So what we won't cover, though, is pruning anything that you have to get a ladder on, on a ladder to prune. Um, we really suggest that if you're getting on a ladder to prune that you call a pro, and it's just a good habit. And I understand you, you're all grown ups, you make your own decisions, but handling pruning tools is one thing on a ladder. Um, if you're thinking about a chainsaw, definitely call a pro. But we're going to look at some basic pruning of trees small trees and shrubs today, and we're really not gonna talk about large trees. For those, call a pro like someone from the International Society of Arboriculture or the American Society of Consulting Arborists uh, and have them come look at your large tree. So why do we prune? Um, when I first started, I was handed the four Ds, and I'm going to work us all the way up to the six Ds, and right here is our five of them. Um, we prune, when we prune, we prune with these priorities in mind. And the easiest and first one is damaged material. We know we can get rid of damaged material at any time. And it's just a matter of getting out there and having time to do it. We prune whenever anything is dead. And we'll talk a little bit about that in detail. We'll prune diseased sections in dry weather. Um, and then things that are divergent, meaning they've got crossing branches or a weak branch union or trunk union. And then lastly, I added discipline pruning in because a lot of times what we're doing is trying to maintain a shrub to a desired size in our landscape and be that because it was there when you bought the house or because you really wanted that shrub but it didn't really fit the space and you need to prune it anyhow. A lot of what we do is discipline pruning, trying to keep it into a shape or size that fits in our landscape. So let's break these down a little bit. So damage. Damage often happens when either we get a heavy snow or a high winds or somebody backs into um, a tree or shrub in your landscape. And what we say is prune as soon as you, it is safe, like if it's snow or ice, you've got to really wait till things melt and nothing else is going to be falling on you. You don't want to um, have an accident in the landscape. Um, and then as soon as it's practical, again, with snow and ice, sometimes it isn't really easy to get out there. Uh, but as, if it's broken and damaged, 
damaged, you do want to remove it. And you want to create a new pruning wound that's clean and easy for the plant to heal rather than a broken, splintered um, wound. That just takes longer for the plant to heal and that allows other organisms to get into the wound. And the other thing is when they're dead, you really can just do that whenever you get out there to prune, remove all the dead stuff. So damaged and dead, that's easy. You can get in there and take that out whenever you need to take it out. Then diseased. So we do have both insects and pathogens that attack trees and shrubs. You know, if it's out there, something's going to either eat it or grow in it. Um, and the ideal time to do it, especially with those pathogens, is when things are dry and the weather is not windy. Um, and then not only to cut the damaged portion out, but cut well below the diseased portion, because what we can't see is what's going on inside that branch um, and different pathogens will have different recommendations for how far down the branch you should cut to, um, to get the, all of the disease portion out. Um, and the other thing is many times you'll see recommendations to sterilize your pruning tools in between cuts. I know that's a lot of, if you've got a lot of, um, in this case, black knot on your tree or shrub, that's a lot of pruning and a lot of sterilizing. So it's, it is important to do that, though, especially um, because you don't want to transfer that pathogen to another tree or shrub nearby and do a really good job of cleaning that. And you can either use diluted bleach, and we can give you recipes for that, or rubbing alcohol on your pruning tools. It's something that most of us might do once a year, but in the case of of disease stuff, you should do it regularly as you cut. Then divergent. And this is kind of like a, a difficult one because this is where you start to make, make some skillful and deliberate choices about which you keep. When do you do it? Well, it's based on the other. Obviously, if something is dead or it is diseased, that's probably the one you're going to prioritize and you're going to do that uh, as soon as you notice that. But if you've got... Um, wounds or a crotch, well, th this is often called a crotch or a, a, a branch union like this, where they're very, very close together. You'll see in the photo on the right, as those grew, they continued to um, grow closer and closer together. And that union right there often includes little bits of bark and dirt and debris, which then leads to potential decay over time, but also it can learn, uh, lean towards um, branches that don't really grow together. There's always a little bit of bark in between there. When you get a high wind or heavy uh, storm with ice or snow, that's the most likely place for the branch to break out. And you probably have seen that if you've got any Bradford pears around or calorie pears around, they are very likely to do this. So this is a tough part, like which do you take, the right or the left? And you got to make a decision. And that's the hard part. You do your best to try to determine which is the healthiest, which is the best, which is in the, in the right direction, and then make a hard decision. And we'll look at later how to actually make that cut. And then discipline. This is a one I added in here because usually it is to maintain size. We want to keep it in, you know, between the driveway and the house, or we're trying to fit it, you know, under an overhang. But there are a lot of other types of disciplined pruning where you're including things like bonsai or espalier plants or pollarded plants. Those are very specific in a very unique setting because you're trying to create a very unique form and a specific form. But usually it is just to maintain the size um, or shape. Then we have my sixth D, which is dismay, <laughs> dismay pruning. Um, you've got plants that are often pruned to allow uh, utility lines to come through, or perhaps it's just something that's what you've always done, like that shrub on the left. You know, we, we tend to make these little ball. Yes, that's it. That's the one, Joellen. I see your, your dismay. Um, it's like a little kind of gumdrop or sometimes a tabletop shrub, partially because people don't actually know what to do to prune that. But if you think about that plant on the left, imagine how it would make a wonderful habitat for insects or pathogens because all the branches are close together. They have a fine old time in there. Or think about a heavy snow load 
or ice storm and how it'd be likely to catch the weight of all those things and break out. And on the right, you've got some um, plums that are pruned. They're just kind of chopped off at the top. And you can imagine you're going to get a lot of new growth up there. And the growth is going to be close together and it's kind of be weakly attached to the branch. So high winds and heavy snows or ice would again be very likely to break those. So I just like to share those dismay photos with you. Um, and then when do you prune? And this is a thing that gives a lot of people kind of consternation about, oh my gosh, is it the wrong time? Is it the right time? So let's we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Uh-oh, that looks complicated. And it is a little complicated. Uh, my husband's a beginner gardener and he's like, there's too many rules. I can't do this. Well, this, these are a few rules and I hope they make sense to you. We already talked about some of the basic principles. If it's dead or damaged, you do it when you need to do it. As soon as you notice the damage and can safely get to it. And if it's dead, you can safely take it out. All the others, ideally you do them during the growing season, but I'll put a caveat in there. Sometimes it has to be when you have time and we all are, are strapped for time. You just have to do it when you have to do it. Um, so important questions though to ask, is this a non-flowering plant or a flowering plant? If it's a flowering plant, we're going to go, um, we're going to go uh, down to two. And if it's a non-flowering plant, we're going to go to one. So say you've got a non-flowering shrub or small tree, often an evergreen, you're going to prune that during the growing season, ideally so that you get the plant to ad do additional growth from the places that you are pruning. But again, like I said, damage or death, you want to do it as soon as possible. If it's a flowering shrub or tree, things get a little more complicated. So when does it flower? Spring or summer? And that's when I see my husband's eyes like glaze over. Okay. Um, I didn't know there was a difference, but there is. Okay. So let's break it down. You'll hear the word sometimes it's a spring flowering shrub or it's a summer flowering shrub. Um, what does that actually mean? And with spring flowering shrubs, it means that the flower buds are actually probably set up the winter, the, the fall before. They've, they've grown in the fall and the bud contains next spring's flower. Whereas summer flowering shrubs grow starting in the spring and create the flower during the active growing season. And we'll look at some examples of that just to kind of walk it through and see what I'm talking about. So think of the lilac. It's out there now in a landscape, a very common shrub. There's two buds at the tip of the branches and each of those buds already contains next year's flower. So in this makes it all the way through the winter, assuming a deer doesn't eat it or you don't prune it out. That bud then expands in this early in the spring and you have flowers in spring. The flowers, if you cut that bud open right now would be inside just really, really tiny. And here's another example. So hydrangea flower buds are in the terminal bud. So hydrangea has a lot of stems. So this is a big leaf hydrangea. For big leaf hydrangea, it is a, uh, the shrubs sets up the flowers in the season previous. So right now out in your landscape, if you have a big leaf hydrangea, the flower buds are there at the terminal bud already tucked inside. The axillary buds are usually just leaf buds and occasionally they can have flower buds in them, but, but primarily you're going to see the flower buds at the tip of each of those hydrangea stems. If a deer comes along and eats them during the winter, you're losing your flowers. If you decide, wow, this thing looks really messy, I'm going to chop it down now, you are cutting out next year's flowers. And that's true for big leaf hydrangea, but there's lots of different hydrangeas and they all have their own rules. So one of the um, one of the resources we want to share with you is a little fact sheet about hydrangeas and which type you might have and when it should be pruned because again, more rules. But it's good to know um, what to do and when. Another way this is sometimes uh, expressed is as in is new wood and old wood. And you might have heard that it blooms on old wood or blooms on new wood. So new wood is wood that is grown in this season in the active current active growing season between spring and fall. So it's going to bloom during that time. 
And if you have hydrangeas in your landscape, you might have some of the hydrangeas that bloom late in the year, like peachy hydrangeas. They'll, they'll be setting up their flowers during the growing season. Whereas, like we said before, the big leaf hydrangeas already set the flower buds up and they're waiting for spring. The other thing that can kill this particular hydrangea is the, the other thing that can kill the hydrangea flowers is cold temperatures. And for hydrangea uh, macrophylla, it often happens as the temperatures dip that the flower buds are killed, but the axillary buds are not killed. So in the spring, you've got this glorious burst of new foliage, but no flowers, just a lot of dead tips. Um, so breeders have now created hydrangeas that have um, the ability to grow flowers on new wood and old wood, which is called remontant. So if the old wood flowers get killed by winter or deer or pruning, you do have a second chance for flowers that'll show up on the new wood. So here's a chance for some input. Um, what do you think happened here to this um, beautiful lilac? See if people want to ch throw some ideas into the chat. Uh, I see another great question. When do you when do you cut the hydrangea flowers? Someone tripped the buds. They pruned it in the fall. Yep, it could have been deer damage. And this is a good question. Was it was it sheared on all sides so they could walk up the pathway and down the sidewalk, or did the deer come along and that's what they could reach? So I'd say a toss. Yeah, pruned as tall as a person could reach, right? And it's out of people's way. It was, um, and so they've actually cut off the flower buds, uh, except for where they couldn't reach them. But yes, a deer could have been responsible for this as well. So some folks had asked. Um, there's a lot of great questions in there, but somebody, someone has said like, how do you, well, basically, how do you know when it's finished blooming? Because a lot of times the, rec the recommendations are bloom after it finishes flowering. Well, with a hydrangea, the flowers just sort of kind of hang out there. It does, they don't really go away. Whereas with a lilac or many other shrubs, the flowers may turn brown and fall off. So it's after, with hydrangeas is when they start to feel papery, then you're reach, reaching the end of their flowering period and they're starting to produce seeds. But with a lot of other flowering shrubs, one of the safe ways to prune is to say, I'll only prune right after it flowers. Well, after it flowers, that could be confusing because the flowers could hang around for a while. So you could also say, as soon as the flowers begin to fade or start to brown and turn papery is a better way to look at it too. Okay, I hope that was clear answer to that question because it's a question we definitely get a lot of. So off of dismay and into how to make those pruning cuts. Again, this would always be easier if we were doing it, it, it together in a room or out in, the, out in the landscape. But what you always want to do is cut to a bud. And I think with this illustration, you can really see what that means. It's the Goldilocks rule here. You want to get it just right. You don't want to be in the first image on the left. You don't want to be too close to the bud because you might either nick the bud or the bud may dry out. You want it to angle away from the bud for a couple of reasons. And one of the main reasons is on the second drawing, if you tried to make that cut, you might actually nip or tip the bud right out of there accidentally. So but safer to angle it away from the bud. You also don't wanna leave a stub. The plant will eventually heal that off, but it's extra work for it to do. And it's an opportunity for things to move in as well if it's just sitting there rotting. So the image on the far right is just right. It's angled away from the bud. There's a tiny bit of a stub, but not a long stub. And that's what you're looking for. And where the finesse comes in is looking at the bud and saying, well, if I cut that one, where is it gonna grow in the future? So it's sort of like a chess game. You've gotta look down the road a couple of years to see if I leave that bud, where's it heading? And that's where people can spend a lot of time thinking about what they're doing and what cuts they're making. But that is also the art of pruning and something that you can really revel in and enjoy and, and not be afraid of. Just do it because there is an opportunity for correction later down the road. So with small branches, those are your rules. But with larger branches, we wanted to spend a little bit of I want to spend a little bit of time looking at how branches emerge from the trunk. What's unique about woody plants, interesting about them is how the branch wood is separate from the trunk wood. So if you look at that image in the middle, the darker tan is actually, actually the wood of the trunk. And you can see where the branch emerged as the trunk was growing. 
the branch died and the tree will wall off the decayed area by, by literally plugging up the vascular tissue and the wood that's there. And then the branch will rot and fall off. Well, we can accelerate that process by making a good pruning cut um, to remove that side branch. But the trick is not to take too much or you might actually cut into the trunk wood. You really just wanna get the branch wood. And that's what the photo on the right is showing us. You see that ridge, which is kind of like um, where the two meet, almost like, a, like the tides meet, the tide of the branch growing and the tide of the trunk growing. And they create this little rucked up um, area on the right. And then you see an area where the branch emerges and the wrinkles stop. And that's really where you wanna cut. You wanna cut the branch off without nicking the trunk because that helps the plant be most efficient and heal like in the photo over on the far left where you get that little donut of tissue that rolls over the wound and closes it up very efficiently. If you do nick the trunk wood, it's not the end of the world. The trunk will heal as well, but it just takes a little bit longer for the plants. Much more efficient if you let the, the wood of the trunk callus over or roll over only the branch stub and, um, and get it just right. You don't wanna leave a long stub or it won't be able to heal around it. You just wanna leave that little short stub. And I'll show you again, another photo here. So if you look on the left, somebody went to cut this branch and they cut it from the top and the weight of the branch pulled it down and it stripped the branch, not only the branch away, but it also cut in to the trunk wood there as well. We wanna avoid that. And so the way we do this is the ABC or one, two, three pruning cut. And it's more, it's definitely more cuts. So there's more work to do there, but you get much more control and a cleaner cut. And the first thing you do is you make about one third up from the bottom, you make a, an ins, a, a cut with your a, a saw. Then you move a little further out on the branch and you cut down from the top. And what usually happens is right at that point, let me see if I can get my pointer here it's you'll get a little stripping the branch will cut itself from b back to a as soon as you come parallel and then you have this little stump that looks like a little ladder or stair step right here but it's very lightweight at that point you can support that and go back and make your c cut and with a c cut it's important not to cut again into the trunk wood you want to cut only branch wood and it might look like you're leaving a stub here, but you're really not. You're cutting only branch wood and then that trunk wood can grow up and cover up the wound that you've just created. And it really heals much faster that way. Let's see if I know how to turn off the, the okay, we're just gonna live with the pointer for a while. It might come in handy, so, <laughs> all right. So that ABC cut, you can see definitely videos online of somebody doing it. If it didn't make sense the way I described it, but hopefully it will. Then let's look at tools and techniques. I carry my pruning tools around me wherever I go in the garden because that's um, I, this, these are just my tools. You know, I need them for almost everything. And the two on the right are the ones that I keep in my belt pack. A good pair of bypass pruners, pruners, not anvil pruners. A bypass pruner is the one that almost cuts like a scissor. One side is sharp, but it passes by the other blade. The anvil pruner is the one that kind of crushes the branch between the two pr pruners, or the, the two blades. One is a flat bottom and the top is a cutter that crushes the branch. Um, most people prefer the bypass pruner because it gives a very clean cut. The other indispensable pruning tool is a small pull cut folding saw. And these usually have six to eight inch blades. They're wonderful and light and easy to keep in a, in a belt pouch. If you need something heavier, you can go to the loppers and occasionally you do need loppers for larger canes on some of the big shrubs. A lopper just helps you get through it faster. But that little pull cut pruning saw cuts very accurately and allows you to get into tight spaces because of the size of the blade. 
What I will tell you that you shouldn't be using are head shears. So people often just grab the head shears to cut a shrub apart. Um, they're really for hedges. They're good for making even cuts across a long distance. They're really poor for making precision cuts. And if you think about back a few slides to us showing you the buds and how to cut to a bud, you couldn't really cut accurately to a bud without accidentally either leaving a stump or cutting into the bud if you were using a pair of head shears. So that's what they're for, leave them for that. But here are three techniques that are super useful for dealing with most of the shrubs you all mentioned in those, um, in the, um, as we went through the first chat question. So thinning is a great way to remove some of the older branches, which no longer flower. And you can assess what you've got and how they are flowering. If you've seen a lilac branch and it's just not doing anything anymore, you know, it's got a lot of holes in it, a sign that there might be some insects going on in there. You want to take that big old branch out and remove it. This it does encourage new growth from the base, which can sometimes be a problem if you've got deer. You may have to protect that new growth, but it often improves air circulation, which is really important if you have a disease or path, you know, disease issue going on. So it, it's a great technique and you can do it a couple of different ways, but just start by thinning out the old and dead stuff usually gives you an opportunity to look at what you have left and make some decisions at that point. Another option is a gradual renewal where every few years you take an, about another 30% of the branches out and new branches grow. So you're constantly recycling new branches um, with the old branches. Uh, it gives you an opportunity again to improve the uh, air circulation, um, but since new branches are growing back in, it's gonna get dense pretty quickly. But what you're ending up with is new growth. So sometimes that really helps with flowering. And somebody mentioned like beautyberry and I'm thinking of um, a couple of other multi-stemmed shrubs. This is a really great technique where you gradually renew the branches. If you've got a whole huge group of say rhododendrons in front of a bay window that you meant to keep low, this is another great way to slowly reduce the height of those because each time you take out a few of the large branches, you'll get a lot of dense new growth from the bottom. And eventually you'll seem to have a new shrub over the course of three to four years that's back in line with what you expected. Again, it's back to that discipline pruning. Was it the best plant for the spot in the first place? No, but you really love rhododendrons. You're trying to work with it and this is what you, you can try to do. So this gradual renewal, remove about 30% of the branches each year and cut them down at the base, really take them down to the base here so that new growth comes up. And then lastly, and maybe a little more uh, dramatically, is rejuvenation pruning, where you hack that baby right down. And this is a great technique, for, especially for rhododendrons. When I first started in the landscape industry way back uh, many years ago, this is what you would get when you p purchase rhododendrons. They were usually harvested from local areas. They would cut all the stems down and pot up a chunk of the roots and a few of the branches. And what you would buy is a beautiful, nice round ball of a rhododendron. But when you poked around down below, you could find the big stumps and wounds from the original rhododendron that they were harvested from. And I don't think we do that in the landscape trade anymore, but this was quite a while ago. Um, the idea here is that you encourage, you get rid of everything that's diseased, everything that has insects boring through it, and you end up with the root system and a few short branches. Um, and what comes up out of it are lots of new growth. And it's often succulent and delicious. And the problem with lots of new succulent, delicious growth is that it can be very attractive to um, deer, for one, but also things like aphids that are looking for tender young plant juices to grow. So sometimes you have to take special precaution um, as those emerge. And I'll show you an idea of what it looks like when you do this kind of pruning. But you, you, it, it does really create a nice new shrub, but it's very drastic and dramatic. Uh, as long as the root system's healthy and as long as you've got good light or the, the proper light for that plant, it's going to come back well. The only place that I've had issues with is when people have called and said, hey, my old rhododendrons are really thin and scraggly. I'm going to cut them back down. It's really good to look at the environment. Has the environment changed since they were planted? Maybe there's a huge hemlock hedge that is now towering over them. They're not going to come back vigorously if that's the situation. So again, look at the conditions that they're in. 
is this the right condition for them? Are they going to come back? Um, another plant that this is frequently done with are willows. Um, willows can take a real hard pruning in early spring, and they put out a lot of new growth. Again, that succulent growth needs protection from deer and is very attractive to insects that are looking for new growth. But it does come back really well. It gives you an opportunity to pull out all the debris and junk that has collected in the center of the plant. The other thing this works really well with is um, spireas. Spireas have a multi-stem shrub, create lots of stems, and they do a good job on their own of slowly renewing new stems for old. But what happens over time is that you end up with a lot of old dead stems in the middle of them and a lot of leaves. So this rejuvenation pruning is a good um, project to engage with. The only issue with that is because some spireas are early blooming and some spireas are late blooming. Again, like with the rhododendrons, if you chop them back early in the year, you might lose that year's cycle of flowers. Same with the spirea, depending on when the spirea produces flowers. But in this case, you're doing it for the greater good and the longer term uh, benefit of this plant and in your landscape. So you decide if it's worth it. For early spring blooming shrubs, you can delay your rejuvenation pruning till just after they've flowered and the flowers start to fade or fall because then you do have significant growing season ahead of you for the plant to grow new foliage. When I would not suggest rejuvenation pruning is just before winter because all that succulent new growth will come up and you might get it might get killed by the first freezes and frosts. So you've got to give with rejuvenation pruning, you've got to give enough time, lead time for that plant to grow new foliage, stems and harden off. So just don't do it right before winter. It probably won't kill it, but it'll kill a lot of the new branches. So it's going to set it back a little bit. So those are th those are three really useful techniques for <clears throat> I'm just going to go back real quick for managing um, shrubs. So thinning just to open it up. And that's a really good somebody mentioned blueberries. This is a great one for blueberries in high bush blueberries. You're looking to create lots of upward new uh, upward tall growth. So you might be getting rid of a lot of those lower branches and sideways branches and it makes good air circulation. So thinning. Oops, come on. Uh, gradual renewal, take out about a third of each of the branches each year, right down to the ground, and then the more drastic rejuvenation. Okay, the three R's. Then there's some quick no-nos and uh-ohs. So needled evergreens. This is somebody mentioned earlier, that blue spruce, that tiny blue spruce. Boy, is that going to be hard to prune. And with a lot of different evergreens that are needled, there's often an interior portion of the plant called the dead zone. And you've probably all seen this if you've ever peeked inside of a hedge. There's this beautiful outward kind of crust of new foliage and green. But if you part the branches inside, it's all dry and brittle. That's called the dead zone. And if you cut into the dead zone, nothing really grows out of that area. New growth on needled evergreens is going to come from those green growing tips and the, the tender branches around it. If you cut back to where the grant branches are brown and dead, nothing's going to come out of that. And there are exceptions. That's nature, right? And nothing is ever, not, everything doesn't always uh, attend to the rules. So there are some needled evergreens that will grow from the dead zone as, as an adaptation. But think about the spruce or somebody mentioned a white pine. You're, you're not going to, you're going to be able to affect the growth tips where things are green, but you're not going to be able to prune into the dead zone. So if you have a tall hemlock and you say, I'm going to turn that into a hedge, you might be able to make the sides a hedge. But if you cut it down from the top and you're going to cut across here, and he's like, oh, I'm going to keep it at 12 feet. This center area here is always going to be brown. It, you'll depend upon the side green branches to bend inward to fill that and it doesn't always happen. You always usually end up with this kind of dead core. So that's an important part to think about when you're approaching a needled evergreen. Um, so with the spruce, it's going to be gentle pruning on the tips um, to create the shape you want. But if unfortunately with some of the spruces like a bird's nest spruce or some of the uh, blue globe spruces, once they've outgrown their spot, there's not a lot of options for you. Um, and then you end up having to rip it out because at some point it's in your walkway, it's up against the house. Um, so 
that's the difficult part with those. You can only cut them back so far before you hit the dead zone. I also wanted to look at some additional no-nos and uh-ohs because these are typical in, unfortunately, sometimes typical in pruning of trees and something that you as a owner of your landscape should be aware of. So this is called topping when you just take the top of the, the tree off. Um, and this is really a, a, a practice that is strongly discouraged, wish it could be made um, a, a law never to do it again. but it still happens sometimes either because people want to do it themselves and they're just not aware of it or because they've asked for it because of a view or another issue or fear of concern about it falling on their house. But what happens with trees that are topped is again, you'll get and it encourages new growth and that new growth is going to be towards the sun. So you're going to get lots of new growth at the tips. Uh, with many branches close together. Those many branches close together don't have a strong branch union and um, they also will you know, perform the job of catching all the snow and all the ice. And that added weight with all those small light branches often causes a lot of breakage in the, in the new and developing canopy. So this is a, pro um, a practice that is really frowned upon and arborists will will not engage in it, but sometimes they, the owner, homeowner just doesn't feel comfortable with the tree next to the house. And I would argue that this is a time to take that tree down and replace it with something that's gonna perform the right height uh, for you and not be a threat to your house in the future. Um, in this case, I don't know what the deal was, can't say why the decision was made, um, but that was somebody's choice. Another similar practice is called lion tailing or overskirting. That's where, again, often because of a view, people will take um, all the lower branches out and just leave the branches at the end, figuring, okay, that's great. The tree has some branches up there and it's got leaves up there. But again, it puts a disproportionate weight of foliage and, and small branches on the ends of these larger branches. And these tend to break and uh, be behave badly in the wind. So they can actually become a hazard tree. In both cases, both the um, topping and lion tailing can become a hazard over time because a tree is not growing balanced as it would normally grow. So it's better off to, if you're gonna have to do some thinning like this, that there are additional thinning cuts on the top as well. Um, again, this is the job of a professional arborist, but you can think about this also in, in a smaller, um, especially lion tailing. I see frequently people do this to lilacs in a smaller scale. They'll say, well, you know, all the flowers are at the top, so let's just leave the top and take everything else out. And you end up with long stems with a lot of growth at the tip. And with a lilac, its normal process is to continually throw new branches up from the base, which you can help with that gradual, uh, that gradual um, renewal pruning. But what people do once they've committed to this lion tailing is they leave everything at the top and every time a new branch comes up, they nip it in the bud. So think about this with many shrubs, you want to encourage growth from the base so that in the future you have the opportunity to take out those older branches once they're no longer productive and uh, aren't flowering well. So um, with that, good, okay. I have, a, I have some resources I wanted to share because this is really tough to show people on a flat screen, right? You really need to see some of this in 3D. So there's a um, University of Maine video on how to prune a lilac, which I think is pretty good. Again, it's flat, but at least you can see the person working in the shrub. We also have for you a pruning hydrangeas PDF that we can share. And I think Matt, we can put, probably put that in the chat, right? That's the, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and that's really helpful because a lot of times people are like, oh, how do I prune my hydrangea? My first question is, what kind of hydrangea is it? And that stops everybody in the, you know, at, at square one. So this, this fact sheet also kind of primes you on which hydrangea you might have um, so that you can then make the educated decision about when and how to prune it. And then lastly, an oldie but a goodie, there's an illustrated guide to pruning ornamental trees and shrubs. And that is also available as a free PDF and that's a booklet. So it goes into more detail about pruning when and how and uh, species. But 
other great resources exist out there as well. Um, one of the one of the ways to look for them, and I'll put this in the chat as well. No, I won't cover. We're not going to cover pruning fruit trees. I'm sorry. I hope that that would be an entire other um, presentation. Um, and maybe that's something to schedule, Matt. I'm sorry about that. If you came for pruning fruit trees, we didn't really get into that. But um, if you if you are looking for a source, one of the easiest ways to find a reputable source, and I'm going to put this in the chat, is to end your search string. If you're looking for, say, you're looking for pruning willow, and end your search string with site colon edu or site colon gov, it's just going to take you to um, sources that have those things only, not advertisements and not trying to sell you pruning tools. So um, then you can use site colon edu um, and as well, or site colon gov. There's a few others as well, but that helps you to find good resources rather than just you know, finding uh, everything and everything everyone wants to sell you. So you are, you will be able to find, there's a couple of fact sheets out there that list like ad infinitum shrub and when to prune it, this shrub and when to prune it, this shrub and when, you know, but I think it's important to first have like the grounding of why these things are important, why you should um, choose one over the other, or one style over the other. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Matt and Joellen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, some great information. We did have a bunch of questions come in. Sure. And um, because of the timing of today, I'm just going to collate those questions and, and hopefully you can respond to those. Uh, we'll, we will put those in the description of the chat um, of the video once we post that. Um, I want to quickly share um, our um, IPM Minute for today, which is a video. Um, I'm gonna put the link to this video in the chat. I know some people might have to jump off. Um, that's perfectly fine. The one thing I wanted to mention before we leave is that our program, the New York State IPM program now has a newsletter. And so I'll put that um, link where you can look at the previous newsletter and subscribe to that if you want IPM information delivered directly to your inbox. Um, I will post the link now to the video that I'm about to show, and you can feel free to uh, jump off at any time. Um, we do thank you for attending our first Friday events and hope you can uh, continue to attend in the future. Thank you. Some experts say that 80% of our landscape tree problems originate below ground, which is exactly where we can't see them. And it's usually us humans that cause the problems in the first place. When choosing your seed mix, go for the ones that have the greatest amount of diversity because the different plants are going to thrive under your different soil conditions and under the different weather conditions. Uh, spotted lanternfly don't bite, they don't sting, and they're not going to survive in the house for very long. Uh, we did a study and found that just over uh, two days is all they can survive at room temperature without feeding on, as an adult, feeding on a tree. And then fold the edges of the lower sheet over the top of the upper sheet and duct tape the two. This completely traps the worms so they won't flee. So as the temperatures increase in that solarization process, they get killed. At 105 degrees, all stages, cocoons, Just eggs, over, immatures, uh, and the adults will die. I want to start by making your garden less hospitable to slugs and snails. This means removing heavy mulch, bricks, boards, things like that from your garden. Those all provide really nice shelters that slugs and snails can hang out under during um, hot weather during the day and then emerge from when night falls to come and eat your plants. So leaving some areas 
kind of untidy, if you will, over the winter definitely is beneficial for um, some insects to live throughout the winter and then for birds to eat the seeds. If you're in a, a position where you're, you're trying to manage it, um, do take kind of a long-term approach. You know, that root system is very extensive. It can take a few years to, to deplete it, but be advised that the roots uh, also contain the oil, even in the winter. Um, so at all times of the year, in all circumstances, you wanna be very careful uh, with poison ivy. Okay, so why are there spiders in your home? And the answer is pretty simple, because they can get in and find prey. And spiders get into your home many, many different ways. Uh, it can be a crack in the foundation. They come in through little cracks in the window or the screen. People talk about um, on their houseplants is fungus gnats. And fungus gnats are sort of mosquito looking. They're small. Um, you'll see them fly out of the foliage if you disturb the foliage. If you have a serious problems of carpenter ants, the first thing that you have to do is you have to find a colony. The ideal eviction time to remove woodchucks is August, September, and in early October. During the winter months, uh, from uh, late October, early November, in the late February, uh, woodchucks are in their burrows hibernating and uh, uh, control is not that valuable. When it comes to which one I pick and what I recommend to clients, I think about the way it's applied. So it's either a collar, a topical, or a chewable, and then the duration, which is generally gonna either be one month, three months, or eight months. And then I think about how the product actually works. 